Nice to be in orbit. Welcome home, Colombia. Beautiful, beautiful.
to be in orbit. Computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Wednesday afternoon of Agility Prime Week. We had an amazing morning with Senator Leahy. Thank you again. And a surprise visitor in General Levitt at the end who stayed on for networking hour. And from the words coming in, uh, it might have been one of the best networking sessions feedback I've ever heard, both from the general herself who joined the small <coughs> mini breakouts, which is wonderful. Thank you, General Levitt. And I'm also happy to announce that we've got one heck of an afternoon planned for you. To get it started, though, uh, up on your screen right now is a poll just to make sure we're doing right by you in getting you networked with the people you want to meet. So there is a live slide on the screen right now. It's going into YouTube chat as well as Slack. As a reminder, YouTube chat and Slack are always open to communicate directly with the Agility Prime team all week long. So please keep going there. And... Take a vote on that slide. Let us know how we did on the networking. But without further ado, let's get right into this afternoon's panel. The first thing is, Nate, welcome back. Super, thanks a lot, Brandon. And thanks for everyone uh, being very agile uh, on this Agility Prime week that we have. Uh, hard to believe we're just halfway through right now. I just walk through some of the places we've been because I wanna put in context some of the discussion that we have for this afternoon. So we started off on Monday morning with the senior leadership talking about the strategic role that this program could play. We went on the afternoon and looked after hearing urban air mobility and the promises of urban air mobility, some of our operators then thinking about alternative missions. On Tuesday morning, talked about how structurally we're running this program to put good rigor in our tests and our acquisition programs and in our airworthiness, but do it in a way that we think we can actually accelerate innovation. Then yesterday you heard from the other innovators and really the pillars across the other parts of government, uh, across Uber. We will mention, by the way, uh, the very end of the session had some technical difficulties. We are going to be replaying parts of Mark Moore's discussion. Uh, because it was just fantastic to hear his vision again, to see the depth of work that Uber has done to launch this market. And then we started off this morning with Senator Leahy and introducing the work that is happening in Vermont. We got to talk through in some depth with all of our companies that are currently on the SBIR contract. And, and the idea that in Agility Prime, we've kind of divided this portfolio of capabilities up into three areas. And you saw our program executive officer, Ms. Linda Rutledge on Tuesday morning, introduce another new capability through the area of interest number two and number three. If you haven't seen those, please visit the website, go to Air Race, and you can download those documents to understand exactly what might be possible as you compete in your Air Race. So we have heat one of the Air Race is 
those Uber sized vehicles, but, but it's across the board, this concept of urban air mobility at a larger vehicle size, three to eight passenger. Uh, we then have heat two, which is our one to two passenger vehicles. And you, you'll notice on some of those that allows some opportunities for some of the companies that maybe have been in the ultralight category and through their participation in the FAA part 103 ultralight category, have been able to get a lot of maturity from just the cycles they've been able to, to do. And those vehicles also, if you, if you believe like many cost and analysts, cost analysts do, uh, that you buy an airplane by the pound, those are smaller planes and those are those orbs of that flavor will be uh, be a lower cost and might give some opportunity for training uh, and for some of the use cases that we might see from a public use uh, as in terms of our defenders uh, that might be able to use that and uh, maybe law enforcement agencies at some point. And then you saw some of our performers this morning, three different uh, cyber companies that are on contract uh, through those small business opportunities. And those are in that cargo category, that larger cargo category, looking likely at unmanned cargo, though the technologies associated are very similar uh, with maybe some of the added benefits of they just by nature of the mission they've been building to are looking at alternative approaches for hybrid electric. So across that portfolio, you see a variety of different capabilities, and we want to dig into those capabilities a little more deeply this afternoon, some, some of the things that we could do with autonomy, with improved avionics, uh, some of the things that we could do through alternative approaches of producing electrical power in flight. It's a very difficult job. And then in the end, we're going to talk with AirMap and some of the ideas that are required to mature as we think about how we put hundreds or maybe thousands of these orbs over the tops of our cities and do it in a way that's safe and actually potentially safer than what we're doing driving on the streets, highways, and byways around our cities today. So I just want to give a little bit of that context before we introduce our first speaker for the afternoon. And there have been many who we have had to really think deeply for being pioneers and providing fantastic leadership in this space. And we would be certainly remiss if we did not have Mike Hirschberg, uh, who I've always got to remind Mike, uh, he always wonders that we had this discussion with General Levitt. Uh, the last time I had much time around any Levitt in uniform was when I flew F-16s many years ago. And it reminded me of a picture that I often bring to Mike's attention uh, when he wonders why a fighter pilot is interested in vertical flight uh, with him as the executive director of the Vertical Flight Society. And I always have to show this picture because the Air Force has a long and distinguished history, actually, of supporting vertical flight. And I 100% support vertical flight myself, as does the entire Agility Prime effort. So without further delay, let me introduce this next speaker that, that truly is a pioneer. Mike Hirschberg began his duties at the Vertical Flight Society. He can talk about the transition of how it became the Vertical Flight Society in June of 2011. And he did that after 20 years of fantastic experience across the aerospace industry, but working primarily in vertical flight. As executive director is responsible for the execution of the strategy direction by the Vertical Flight Society Board of Directors. He represents the vertical flight technical community and advocates for advancement of vertical flight research and technology to the execution, uh, to the executive and legislative branches of government. He's also the publisher of society publications, including VertiFlight and the Journal of the American Helicopter Society and the annual forum proceedings. He has done a fantastic job of bringing this community together uh, for electric vertical takeoff and landing, and it's really created many of the speakers that you see here this week are, are those speakers that Mike has found, and it, he's continued to build this community, and we appreciate him joining us here today as we continue to nurture that community, even in this time of global crisis. So without further delay, 
Let's go to the electric vertical takeoff and revolution, landing revolution uh, with Mike Hirschberg, and he'll explain to you why he loves the term flying cars so deeply. Mike, thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks so much, Colonel Diller. Uh, it's been a real pleasure working with you the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, I think we've done a lot of great stuff, and we're very, very excited and, and very happy to be part of this uh, Agility, Pl Agility Prime launch. Um, I've got uh, our information up here on the screen. Uh, we've got two websites, one on the Vertical Flight Society in general, and then uh, several years ago, uh, three years ago now, we started a, a bespoke website, evtall.news, just trying to capture what was going on in the ET, evtall world. We started a directory. We had about six or eight different uh, concepts. Uh, now we have 270, more than 270 concepts uh, that people are looking at, innovators around the world for you know combining the uh, vertical takeoff and landing capabilities of a helicopter with uh, the high-speed forward flight of, of a fixed-wing aircraft. And... Um, as uh, as Nate mentioned, uh, you know, flying cars. Um, you know, the word "flying car" is kind of clickbait. Um, the uh, you know, it it's been very successful. It's gotten over three thousand people uh, to come to this uh, kickoff event, uh, and that's really great. And you know, if uh, if Dr. Roper wants to call them flying cars, and and he's uh, willing to put in millions or hundreds of millions of dollars into helping to support the industry advanced electric VTOL aircraft, and hey, we can we can call them flying cars. But uh, uh, Colonel um, Went, uh, Wenthe uh, mentioned uh, the Air Force has some experience with flying cars, and this is really what a flying car is. Uh, the technical term is a rotable aircraft, something that can both fly in the air and drive on the ground. And for the most part, that's not what uh, people are looking, looking at. Um, again, okay, orbs. I don't know what an orb is, but uh, you know, here's the definition that uh, that uh, Nate showed. Um, I think it was on Monday. So you know, if you want to call it a, an, an orb, uh, you know, and you're willing to support the, the industry, then hey, we can call it a, an orb as well. Um, there's a typo though on this slide. Is that use the word rotor, and there's a difference between a rotor and a propeller. And for the most part, most EV tall aircraft use um, use propellers. So a, a rotor is specifically designed to fly sideways. Uh, it's a very complex um, mechanism, as I'll describe in, in a minute. Uh, but propellers generally are generally fixed uh, pitch, but certainly don't have psychic and collect collective. And that's really the, the enabling technology is to be able to reduce some of the complexity. So a bit about uh, the Vertical Flight Society. We were founded in 1943 as the American Helicopter Society, just as the first Helicopters in the U.S. were starting to take off. The uh, Army Air Forces at the time uh, gave the first contract, the first American helicopter production contract. Uh, and it was realized that, you know, we really need a community to help support uh, the development of these vertical flight aircrafts. And we need to bring together industry, academia, and government, uh, operators, uh, builders, suppliers, everybody together to, to work on this technology and, and, uh, and help to advance uh, advance this new capability. At the time, the Army Air Forces was really, were really looking at things that were, you know, as fast as they could go, long range, payload, it was bombers, it was fighters. And here comes along this, this dinky aircraft that, uh, or type of aircraft that had very little payload capability, uh, range, uh, endurance, anything. And so the Army Air Forces was, was really looking at, you know, fighters and bombers and, and, you know, why do you need this capability? Well, Vertical takeoff and landing is a really uh, enabling capability. Uh, so fast forward 70 years, we had the world's first eVTOL workshop. You see a lot of the pioneers of the industry here, Mark Moore when he was at NASA, um, people from, from Boeing, uh, Joe Ben was there, John Piasecki, the, all these legends, uh, Eric Allison, uh, Rob McDonald from, uh, from uh, all now at, uh, at Uber. Um, Tom Gunnerson from, from Kitty Hawk. I have lots of people from, from NASA. Um, Susan Gorton, the, uh, the, um, the program uh, project manager of what's now the Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Project at NASA. So uh, we were limited on space by 100 seats for the room that we were able to get. Uh, you see a Shish guy here in the middle. Um, Bud Scriba, um, who's uh, very very big proponent of um, hydrogen propulsion is uh, is here at the table. 
Uh, he'll be speaking on, on Friday uh, as one of the um, exhibitors. Uh, so it was the first time to really bring together in public industry, academia, and government uh, to together to help uh, start the beginnings of working together to advance the technology. So the Vertical Flight Society, I mean, eVTOL is one part of what we do, It's but we're really all types of vertical flight. Um, anything that spins and generates lift or thrust, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is vertical flight. So we don't do, do balloons, we don't do rockets. Uh, you know, uh, F-16s uh, and other aircraft that, can, that have a uh, thrust weight of greater than one, uh, you know, as long as they can hover, if they can uh, take off and land that way, then hey, that's, uh, that's vertical flight as well. I'm actually here in, um, in what at the time was the American Helicopter Society because I was working on the Joint Strike Fighter Program, which was obviously not a, uh, not a helicopter. Um, uh, you'll just see uh, the last image there, our most recent issue uh, came out uh, yesterday. It's got a feature article on, uh, on GoFly. Um, uh, Gwen Leiter spoke yesterday, some really, really innovative work, just fantastic development. Uh, she won our big uh, VSAL uh, technology or, or um, advanced vertical flight award this past year. Um, a little bit more on technology. So this is what we see as an electric VTOL revolution. It's uh, electric propulsion, hydro, hydro, uh, hybrid propulsion, all types of things that enable um, new technologies. Uh, there's been different terms, urban air mobility, um, all these different terms. I've, we've, for several years, have broken it down this way. Uh, it's eVTOL. Electric VTOL technology is the enabler for all these things. Everything from small package delivery, personal flight, uh, ultralights, cargo, you've seen some of these things, um, air taxis, regional or rural air mobility. Uh, so lots of um, different things. Then what do we call them? Well, you heard yesterday, NASA is calling them uh, advanced air mobility or AAM. Uh, Air Force, again, you want to call them orbs, hey, that's fine. Um, we're, um, you know, we're just trying to talk about the, the technology that's really the, the key enabler. So eVTOL uh, aircraft have been flying for several years uh, under the Part 103 ultralight exemption. They don't require certification, uh, but obviously everybody wants these to be safe. No one wants to get hurt. So um, just an ex as an example, opener and um, uh Opener and uh, Kitty Hawk um, have both flown like 25,000 uh, times. So they're really trying to prove out the, uh, the technology and, and the, the viability for these for our commercial projects. And, uh, you know, electric, uh, these are not electric helicopters. So um, Sikorsky uh, a decade ago looked at electrifying one of their Schweitzer aircraft. Um, on the ground is all the stuff you take out. If you go from a piston engine to electric power, those are two big bus batteries on the, on the side of the aircraft. Um, that's the engine, that's the, um, the fuel system, the exhaust system, uh, and that's just to power a conventional rotor. But we're really not talking about that. Um, you know, getting rid of all the complexity of a helicopter, the cyclic collective swashplate, transmissions, gearboxes, hydraulics, all these things are, are expensive, costly, um, costly to maintain. Uh, so with distributed electric propulsion, it's replacing all these complex, sorry, replacing these complex mechanism with uh, cheaper, lighter, um, dumber, uh, simple, complex, uh, simple uh, thrusters. And everybody, uh, you know, says that uh, batteries don't have as much power as, as fuel. That's, that's absolutely right. I mean, comparing, depending on how you compare it, Batteries, you know, one twentieth or one fiftieth of the specific energy of, of fuel. Uh, but if you can transition to a wing and get off of the propulsor, then you can gain back a lot of that efficiency. And for those who are in, uh, concerned about noise, which is a key enabler, or a tailpipe emissions, uh, electric VTOL can also um, enable that. So just like uh, you know, we're not talking about electric helicopters, although there is you know roles for different uh, different types of mechanisms. Just like when people invented a, a car, it wasn't a horse, uh, it wasn't a mechanical horse, it's a totally different uh, paradigm. So talking a little bit about the history or prehistory of eVTOL. Uh, so 2010, uh, Mark Moore did a kind of a, a foundational study on a uh, single, uh, actually single seat, but single person stand up uh, eVTOL takeoff, uh, uh, vertical takeoff aircraft called the Puffin. Uh, but at the same time, there was a lot of development, a lot of uh, tinkering, a lot of um, uh, innovation. So here are some of the different uh, examples of aircraft. 
uh, none, of, none of them in the US, uh, but different types of aircraft that were really the first. And they were all in this second, uh, in the middle uh, part of uh, 2011. So this is sort of the, the big bang of, of eVTOL. Now, I mentioned we have over 270 designs on our website, evtol.news. Uh, but I mean, those are designs, right? And to look at uh, Otto Lilienthal uh, in the, in the uh, 1800s, you know, to design an aircraft is nothing. To build one is something, but to fly is everything. And of course, he didn't realize that, um, you know, there's even something more, more important, which is to um, be able to have something that's commercially viable and successful. Um, so, you know, I came up with this, uh, this term, some people call it the Hirschberg principle. You know, it's easy to design an aircraft if you don't know how. Um, yes, you can maybe get this thing to fly uh, with all these little propellers, but is that going to be something that's uh, commercially viable and going to have a compelling capability that's, that's better than what's out there? So we want to have innovators. We want to have people with radical ideas. But, you know, there are laws of physics that you need to obey and think about and, uh, you know, um, they're, they're called laws for a reason. Uh, many of you may have heard this. I heard this as an undergraduate. You know, if you want to start, if you want to end up with a small fortune in aerospace, you know, you need to start out with a large one because it takes a lot of money to develop uh, aircraft uh, and certify them for safe operational use. So why now? You know, there's all these advancements in, in, uh, in technology, uh, the changes in, in FAA regulations, um, and people are hungry for new, new innovations. Um, and with the app economy, there's lots of people who have now developed uh, uh, lots of, I'll say, surplus capital or capital that they're willing to invest. You see Elon Musk here with uh, his, his SpaceX project uh, to, to launch astronauts to, um, to, to space. Uh, other people like Jeff Bezos um, and others, um, we heard from... Uh, um, you know, from the founder of Pinterest, who's now the, the chair of, of, um, of Joby. So lots of investments now trying to ra uh, radically change society as we know it for the better. So uh, there's something called the Gartner hype cycle, which is, you know, this, this huge inflated expectations of flying cars and EVs all. And we're still going up that, uh, that, that peak, although maybe with COVID-19, Maybe there is some more rational uh, rationality, or, or maybe uh, reduce some of the enthusiasm. We want the enthusiasm to to come, but we really need people who are going to obey the laws of physics and learn. We have tons of resources uh, from 75 years, 76 years of development. Um, so we need everybody to join the EVTOL revolution and make sure that we don't have something like with the dot com boom and bust. That we have people looking from clear eyed. Uh, perspectives of how to advance the technology. And uh, these, you know, these charts are, are available. You guys can read them more at your pleasure. Uh, but just to kind of quickly go, you know, it's got to have a compelling uh, capability, low operating costs. Uh, there's a lot of things, you know, improvements in batteries, uh, advances in, in manufacturing, lower noise. There's a potential for a huge step change in improvement versus uh, either helicopters or cars or, or other, um, other alternative forms of transportation. So Uber unveiled their um, white paper in 2016 is uh, fast forwarding to a future of on-demand urban air mobility, uh, urban air trans transportation. And that's really what they've done. They've, uh, for those of you who uh, haven't seen Mark Moore or Uber's pitch before, is really trying to do supporting the ecosystem of everything that needs to be done for uh, to enable uh, on-demand mobility or flying cars or air taxis. But there's a lot of key challenges. Uh, here's a few of them here, technology, infrastructure, um, piloting, standards and regulations, public acceptance, and this race to be the first uh, to market, to have first mover advantage. So we're working on all of these different uh, technologies. Um, we're working with lots of different uh, associations we formed something we're calling the, uh, informally the UAM Coordinating Council. So trying to harness the work that other, uh, with all these associations have done over the years. Uh, this is just a loose uh, affiliation or a loose discussion group trying to coordinate and collaborate. Um, we're also you know, working with uh, the SDOs, Standards Development Organizations. So all this work is being done uh, for the last you know, six, seven, eight years. And we're very happy that the uh, Air Force is now raising the profile because we need everybody's help to make this happen. 
So online resources, uh, we have the world's uh, largest uh, have library of vertical flight resources. Um, as I mentioned, we've got some different uh, websites, uh, social media, newsletters, uh, videos, uh, educational tutorials, short courses, all kinds of, of resources. And it's just for some perspective, it's important to realize where we are. Um, so, you know, nobody's got a finished product today that's been certified, that's, uh, that's uh, ready for operational use. We're kind of where we were in the 1930s with helicopters. Uh, we think that with bringing everybody together, we can have much more rapid advances in technology and, and capabilities so that we can get, we can fast forward to that uh, future when uh, aircraft are being, uh, EVTA aircraft are being used uh, to, to change the way people move in society. Um, but this is not happening. I mean, it's the first steps will be in 2023 with the first uh, certificated aircraft and, and flights. Uh, but that's not the end. That's the beginning. So over the next 5, 10, 20 years, uh, just like with the turbine revolution, the drone revolution, the Internet revolution, it's going to keep getting better and better uh, every day. Uh, every year. This is like uh, landing somebody on the moon. So the EVTOL revolution, you know, we're on track, but, you know, there's a thousand reasons why it's not going to work. So we need to all work together uh, to find solutions for all these problems and things that will work. And, um, you know, to take it, to invent a new industry, it's going to take everybody's, everybody's efforts. Uh, so we hope that, uh, that you guys will, will join uh, this EVTOL revolution and, uh, and work together so that we can all uh, reach this, uh, this capability of flying cars and flying orbs and everything else uh, that's going to be uh, fantastic for the, uh, for, um, for the average citizen and have great capabilities for the nation, both uh, from an economic perspective and uh, hopefully uh, for improvement in, our, in overall uh, enjoyment of life. Super, Mike, thanks uh, for that presentation. Thank you very much for the precise language that you use in describing this. It makes a difference. Uh, and thanks for the leadership that you provided. Uh, I think as you may have saw, seen at the beginning of the week, our, our audience largely put themselves in the category of zealots for this. And so it's nice to have you to continue to encourage that group of zealots uh, to find their spot in the ecosystem to make this industry run forward. And on the I idea of polls, we've got now, I think another poll, Brandon, we'll, we'll leave our results from the networking poll up, some entertaining things that come out of that. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Brandon, over to you for our next poll. Yeah, I'll hold on the networking results and the world rec results until the end of the session here at five Eastern. So right now up on the screen is a new poll that I think is, is kind of a fun one. So if you, Click, uh, the instructions are on screen. And we wanna know which of the below risks pose the greatest challenge to widespread use of orbs. And I'm looking over the live YouTube stream right now. It looks like that course question is going up live. So head over there, give us your vote. We'd love to hear your opinion. We're also gonna be doing another poll shortly for the panel. So you guys are gonna be able to ask more questions. And I also remind you Slack and YouTube chat is always live and we're always monitoring it and we always bring it live through Nate and others in order to make sure your questions are answered directly from the audience. So please go fill out that poll. It's on your screen right now. And Nate, back over to you to introduce the next crew. Super, thanks. Uh, you've got to meet, you had the opportunity to meet several of our teammates here on the Agility Prime team. And there's just some fantastic experience, uh, both uh, folks with a variety of experience. Next two individuals I'd like to introduce Dr. Ashish Bagai. Ashish had spent over five years at DARPA doing some amazing work in the vertical takeoff and landing world, uh, most notably running the VTOL X-Plane program. Uh, this was one of the first opportunities to look at how DOD might start to use distributed electric propulsion. And as is often the case, uh, DARPA, you know, if they're over 50% success, they're failure because they're not taking enough risk. And Ashish has pulled some fantastic lessons learned from that. He is supporting Agility Prime right now. So I'd like to hand it over to Ashish and then just following him, uh, we've got Sterling Alley who also 
has been working on different alternative approaches to propulsion that might allow us to focus on one particular attribute of these vehicles that is often seen as a big limitation and that's range. And so between Ashish and Sterling, I'd like for you all to hear a little bit about the complexity of this propulsion discussion that we're going to have later on uh, with our panelists. And then we'll get on a little bit beyond that uh, to uh, some of the avionics and the UTM. Uh, but before we do, over to Ashish. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, Ashish. Thank you, Nathan. You're very kind. It's a pleasure to be here. It's also a pleasure to serve. Um, the Jaluti Prime program has been a fantastic adventure so far. And there's so much happening and so quickly that it's, uh, it reminds me of my good old DARPA days. Um, if I may ask uh, for, uh, for you to uh, just uh, flash the one slide that I have. Uh, I just like to use that as the reference. Okay, so while that comes up. Uh, slide up. Yep. Dr. Okay, Ashish, up. you're watching the delayed YouTube right now. The slide is live for you, so proceed with your slide. It is up. The world is watching. Take it away. Thank you, Brandon. I can see nothing but my pretty face here, so I wasn't sure it was up. Fantastic. So anyway, uh, this is a slide that uh, that kind of evolves with time because it is a temporal slide. On the y-axis, I have time, and on the x-axis, it's just numbers of aircraft that have been built. It actually underscores the development of the helicopter and vertical flight machines over the decades. And uh, and you'll see on the far left bottom that we started out with, uh, with some very primitive uh, uh, concepts like autogyros, and up on the right, uh, top right corner, you see the acceleration that we see in terms of new VTOL development taking place in the current decade, in the current uh, last five years or five, uh, ten years. So in reference to this chart, uh, I have a few comments uh, just, to, just to put things into perspective. They build a little bit upon uh, what Mike mentioned in his presentation, which was uh, rather rather comprehensive. And I just want to point out that, you know, we started off, first there were balloons, and then there were gliders, airplanes, gyroplanes, helicopters, and rockets. And so it went for decades. And it's remarkable to note that eVTOL first emerged just about a decade ago. And a few unusual concepts at first, they were comprised of a, of a multitude of rotors. And then with increasing fervor, we saw scores of new configurations, winged, wingless, tilt rotors, mixed lift and propulsion concepts. The configuration space became almost limitless. And it started steering away from the monolithic rotors and complexities of mechanical transmissions of traditional rotorcraft. And instead, the landscape is now bespeckled by a plethora of small prop rotor aircraft. These are eVTOL. They're emerging as small, efficient, affordable, utilitarian aircraft that history has always promised in the flying car. But what makes eVTOL viable today are the advancements in key technologies that preceded their emergence. And these include electric motors with high torque densities, rechargeable batteries of high specific energies that are also capable of delivering high power advanced over-actuated flight control systems to manage complex aircraft behaviors under a variety of flight conditions, advanced decision-making algorithms and integrated sensors, sophisticated design tools and methods, and most importantly, the affordability and ubiquitous availability of these subsystems and technologies across the spectrum. And these permitted then the indulgence of visionaries to enable novel and unique concepts. But the question that remains is, so what? Why electrify at all? And there are a few important considerations here, especially as compared to conventional aircraft. Helicopters have large rotors. While they are efficient hovering machines, they are typically powered by turboshaft engines and mechanical transmissions. They have complex flight critical control systems that are in the rotating frame, which makes them susceptible uh, to high vibratory loads. And that requires a lot of maintenance and inspection uh, to make sure that none of those flight critical systems are ever compromised. Helicopters are also limited in speed because of the physics of edgewise flight through the air. They are loud. It's not just engine noise, 
but there are a variety of sources of noise that helicopter rotors produce. They are expensive to own and operate. And for these reasons, they're often impractical for short, cost-effective organic operations. And really, this is where the electric VTOL concept of the eVTOL aircraft come into the picture. Electrification offers opportunities to disaggregate the propulsion systems from one or two large rotors to several small propellers. It permits the addition of wings for more efficient translational flight akin to fixed wing aircraft. Uh, it, allows, uh, it allows us to exploit useful characteristics of interactional aerodynamics, trying to improve the overall flight efficiency through transition flight from hover to wingborne and back to hover. They have very different vibratory characteristics and, and dynamics compared to helicopters. They are not limited by retreating blade stall, which is the primary reason why helicopters cannot fly faster than about 175 knots. And they have completely different control architectures with a very high level of integrated automation. By virtue of their design, they are quieter than helicopters. And by virtue of their design, they are far less complex. So the advantages and uses are numerous. And in this session, I believe we will hear about some of these subsystems, key sub-technologies, subsystem technologies that are, going, that are critical to enabling efficient, safe, and integrated flight using eVTOL aircraft. So with that, I pass it back to you, Nathan, to introduce the thing. Thank you. Excellent, Ashish. I think it's fascinating to see that change over time. Uh, and what uh, I think that graph really highlights what so many have described as this revolution. Certainly, there will probably be a retraction in the, in the types of designs maybe out there. But, but with the flexibility that this gives, this may be just an entirely new way in, in terms of number of vehicle designs we see over time. So. Fascinating. Thanks for those insights. Thanks for your support. Now I'll hand it over to Sterling Alley to talk in more detail about the propulsion systems that we're going to see this afternoon and some of the challenges and opportunities with those. Sterling? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Nate. And uh, what a great overview of just the incredible volume of innovation in rotorcraft design that we're seeing and living amongst today. It's clear that it's really the beginning of a new era of aviation. Uh, Shish, thank you for that. So great to be working alongside someone with such great knowledge and wealth of information in this field. So earlier this morning, we spoke with the CIBR contractors and air race participants who are partnered with our Air Force to build orbs of many varied descriptions, each uniquely suited to fulfilling missions within our airspace. Those performers have been keeping myself and the rest of the Agility Prime team so very busy working on getting these platforms flying in our air, in our air race. The whole team here is so aware of the trust that these innovators have placed in the United States Air Force and Agility Prime by inviting us to take part in the development of their technology. Working with such groundbreaking tech, oftentimes a passion project of years for these innovators is truly an honor. Even with all the late nights, they have kept me up double checking milestone reports. This afternoon, however, we wanna take a moment to realize that an aircraft is nothing more than the sum of many little parts organized into groups functioning seamlessly. As we at Agility Prime have been reviewing the project materials, they've highlighted that these subsystems, as we engineers call them, as a facet of this industry that we were aware of, but perhaps not giving the attention it deserves. So many companies out there, hopefully watching today, are working tirelessly to uh, these companies design avionics, composite airframes, propulsion systems, sensor arrays, flight controllers, and my personal favorite, advanced AI. Every day we see that there are innovators facing challenges related to flying orbs in all sectors, and that they're pushing the boundaries of what is possible every bit as diligently as those OEMs we spoke to earlier. We wanted to set aside this afternoon for a select few of these subsystem or associated tech developers to speak on their perspective of a future flying orbs, some challenges they face, and how they are overcoming these roadblocks with persistent engineering. So back to Colonel Diller to introduce our moderator, Max Finkel. Super, thanks for that, Sterling, and I think a really good preface here. Thanks for the time and all the work that you and Ashish are putting into making this future come to fruition. Our next uh, panel, I'm sorry, our next host for this afternoon, for a fantastic group of panelists, is Max Fankel. He is the Director for Unmanned and Emerging Aviation Technologies at the Aerospace Industries Association. Uh, as you've heard, today we've had a Vertical Flight Society, General Aviation Manufacturers Association, and this Aerospace Industries Association, over 100 years 
of being the voice for both those aircraft manufacturers and as Sterling noted, the critically important manufacturers of all the subcomponents that go into making a vehicle fly into the future and making sure that we have the right supply chains uh, to continue both advances in the in the vehicle, but advances in those subsystems that continually allow us to push the edge of what's possible. So with that, Max, thanks for the fantastic partnership that you have provided here for Agility Prime and looking forward to hearing more from the spectacular panel that you have set up for this afternoon. Thanks so much, Nate, and really appreciate you allowing AI to be a small part of this week. The programming so far has been absolutely amazing, and we're looking forward to the, the rest of the week and a really exciting panel this afternoon. Um, AIA from the get-go, as Nate mentioned, has been very supportive and a full partner with the Agility Prime team, and can't wait to see what the work that, uh, that goes on with the program. So with that, I want to introduce our, our first panelist, Dr. Michael Winter, from Pratt & Whitney. He's a seasoned corporate leader who's held numerous responsibilities running technical and multinational organizations. His current position is Senior Fellow for Advanced Technology, and he's responsible for the establishment of strategic technology roadmaps, securing the resources for their realization. With that, Dr. Winter, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And on behalf of Pratt & Whitney, I am honored to have the opportunity to talk to you about enabling propulsion for eVTOL. Next slide, please. Pratt & Whitney is a premier company in the development, production, and fielding of large commercial aircraft engines and propulsion systems, military, where we power the United States Air Force and our allies, as well as the only propulsion system on fifth generation fighters, as well as producing smaller engines that are applicable in the eVTOL space for business jets, turboprops, and helicopters. And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments. On the next slide, we wanna think holistically across the space of aircraft propulsion about how do you achieve eVTOL. And today, eVTOL from a, uh, is, is capable and possible, certainly for a few passengers over a few kilometers, that's doable, that's doable all electric with batteries today. But I'll call your attention to the very bottom line on the slide, the number of kilowatts required to achieve these missions going from eVTOL all the way up to large commercial transports. And as you can admire the number of zeros in the number of kilowatts span over five orders of magnitude. As we go to slide four, we'll just dig a little bit deeper into that and look at the power levels required. And what we'll find is that there's a real important opportunity here in the development of the technologies. For eVTOL, you need about a half a watt to a megawatt. And if you link all the way over on the right-hand side, think of a large transport, say a, a single aisle aircraft, a 737 or an A320 is roaring down the runway. Each engine is generating about 18 megawatts of power. If I had that half a megawatt to a megawatt running in parallel with that, it lets me optimize the design of that engine. And similarly, the, the, that half a megawatt to a megawatt is a critical in terms of all the different range of aircraft from, all, again, electric, all the way up to the large transports. And it's the same motors, it's the same generators, it's the same controllers, it's the same distribution network. It's just arranged in a slightly different manner. So if you go to slide five, you'll see it really just comes down to systems engineering. For pure electric, I just go battery with the controller to the motor and then straight to my propulsor. For the larger range and payload, I could do that with serial. And as was said earlier by some of the prior speakers, that gives the redundancy. It gives you unique aircraft and propulsion architectures. It also, that redundancy adds to the safety as well as providing for control of the attitude of the vehicle. And again, as I go to even larger payload and range, I might arrange that in a parallel hybrid application, thereby letting me take advantage of designing the gas turbine engine for peak operation, and then handling all the transients and off-design conditions through the electrical actua um, 
uh, componentry. And we go to slide six. We'll now look at just the first left-hand panel shows you the efficiency, the thermodynamic efficiency. And the cluster of dots on the bottom is the efficiency of turboprop engines today. These are typically 30 to 35% efficient. When I contrast that with these large gas turbine engines, they tend to be 50 to 55% thermodynamic efficiency cruising at flight. Why the big difference? Is it size? Not so much. The physics a little bit, but mostly it's about market dynamics. Because the volumes are so low on these turboprop engines, it's more about what the price the market will bear dictates the technology. So what do we conclude from that? It means that there's an opportunity. It means that we can introduce new technologies that make those smaller engines much, much more efficient. Now, if you click once more, you'll see the middle panel, and this looks at the energy density in terms of volume and in terms of um, mass for jet fuel. And you can see it's about 45 megajoules per kilogram. Click one more time, and in the right-hand panel, what you'll see is all the known battery chemistries against the same metrics. These are both experimental as well as production battery chemistries. Now, these are at the cell level. When I need to put this in an aircraft, I've got to put a big metal box around it that's fireproof. I've got to have current management. I need thermal management. I need lots of other things that adds mass. Now, I cheated a little bit in this graph because the scales are a little bit different. So if you click one more time, I'll put them all on the same axis. And as you can see, the jet fuel turns out to be about two orders of magnitude higher energy density today than the batteries that we know and even in the laboratory. That's a concern. Of note, there are two other species that we share planet Earth with that fly uh, that use similar energy density fuels. Goose fat, you'd find just below the jet fuel, and honey is just a little bit below that in terms of where you'd spot it on this chart. Now, if you go to slide seven, let's think about the other aspect of efficiency when I go from a direct drive of say, a thermal engine driving a propulsor. When I go to add the uh, electronical componentries, click one more time, you'll see that we add many different uh, subsystems each of which has a slight inefficiency. And that means that you get a little bit lower efficiency, about 10%, but click two more times on the slide and you'll see on the bottom right, it also adds cost, it adds complexity, but that's a system level trade relative to the safety and redundancy to allow us to deploy these in our civil commercial environment, as well as on the battlefield. As we transition to the very last slide, I'd like to make two points. Number one, this is not a new idea. In 1842, Stringfellow and Long were awarded a patent for a steam-powered flying air carriage. And in uh, 1882, the cartoon on your right-hand side was published. It was published in France, and the caption read, Life in the Year 2000. Well. We believe the time is now. And to that end, the second point I'll make is that at Pratt & Whitney, we are stepping up. We've embraced agile methodology. We've launched a new division called Gatorworks, and we're applying it directly to the technologies that are enabling propulsion in this space. Recently, last year, we took a small engine. We combined the entire stationary frame of reference to a single part, printed it using additive manufacturing, was a 98% reduction in part count, and we ran the engine all in less than eight months and at a slight fraction of the cost. Similarly, we, did, uh, we took a design for a propulsor for a distributed uh, EV tall aircraft, and we designed it, we built it again using additive manufacturing, and we tested it to get the noise levels and we shared those decibel levels with our DOD customer, and the entire project was done in three months. So we're really excited about it. The time is now, it's here, and we are ready. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Winter. That was a fantastic presentation. Well, next, we'll move to Jason Myron from Collins Aerospace. Jason's a technical fellow in Collins Aerospace's avionics business unit based in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He, in this role, he serves as a system architect on a range of Air Force programs, sets internal technical strategies and roadmaps, including leadership in the applications of DevSecOps to avionics. He focuses on rapid application of avionics to unique use cases, crew workload reduction, and reapplication between civil and military avionics. Over to you, Jason. Great, thank you so much. Appreciate that introduction and uh, happy to be here. I'd like to talk a little bit about Collins to start with today, and then a little bit about urban air mobility and then look forward to this panel discussion. Just a quick overview on Collins. Uh, myself, I've been here 20 years. Um, just a really incredible high tech company bringing uh, great solutions to both civilian and military as, uh, as you introduced me, Max. I have worked a lot with uh, military solutions over the years, but bringing back and forth those commercial and military. And the other thing that's uh, exciting about Collins is just those tough technical challenges. I think anybody in this industry, they love the work they do because it is the hardest challenges. Let me just give a quick overview on slide three of the, uh, of the business units that we do have. We have uh, three major business, six major business units, and I'm in avionics. So that's that's your flight deck avionics, the sensors that are there, all the integrity that you need for that uh, avionics, electronics inside that aircraft, but also our information management system and the back end systems that uh, interconnect on the ground, aircraft to ground. As we go into the next slide, on slide slide uh, four the legacy innovation. You know, what's what's cool about this area, and, and I think we kind of saw a little bit this morning, was these uh, these pictures of, of the great innovators of the past, and they're all black and white. You know, Collins has some great innovators, everyone from Art Collins and avionics to uh, Paul Rettier in, in propellers and propulsion, so just some incredible, but these are black and white. We're, we're in the urban air mobility segment where we're in this new cutting edge. It's time for some color pictures of these new innovators in these areas. So, uh, you know, in, in Collins, we have uh, some innovation priorities from, for the future that are just well synced up to the needs of the urban air mobility, these fly, these fly orbs. Um, I brought forward four key pillars that I think are representative of some of the technologies that a company like Collins can bring to bear and, and, and help in the success of this. Particular for me, I'm passionate about the integrated and optimized solutions, the autonomy, the simplified vehicle operations. As Dr. Roper mentioned on that first day, he'd like to be able to get in one of these and fly. And there's so much to that. And I think one of the key aspects will be some of the autonomy and the systems that make that happen. I, I, I know in an airplane myself, when I'm flying, my passengers seem somewhat in awe of the buttons I'm pressing. I'm, I'm, less, I'm maybe more jaded, but I realize that's where we need the autonomy in the future to, to bring us that simplified operation. As you look at slide six of my presentation, what, what I wanted to show was, for these aircraft and this class of aircraft, we have a variety of technologies that are appropriate and useful to the urban air mobility segment, to aircraft in this class. And while there's a wide breadth of technologies, I will admit today from the panel perspective, my focus is on the flight deck, my passions on the flight deck, uh, the sensor solutions that, that make sure you have the integrity when you can't see outside and you're flying this vehicle or the autonomy is flying this vehicle, and having the flight deck that's optimal for the pilot. I've cared a lot about that for all 20 years, and, and uh, I'm, I'm super excited uh, for the next 20. Uh, I don't think I'll retire before then, and I think it's going to be some exciting years for me. Let's, let's just talk a little bit about some of the underlying capabilities, the flexible, adaptable, fast-to-field technology that I think you need to be successful here. Um, as mentioned earlier, I think you have to embrace Agile. You have to have that feedback loop. You can't just take a big list of requirements and, 
and spend two, three, five years creating a solution. Fast feedback loop, rapid delivery of updates, that's how you're gonna to get to simplified vehicle operations. I also think one of the things we need is flexibility. I'm a big proponent of no code solutions. The ability either for you, the manufacturer of the vehicle, or the end user, the US Air Force, to be able to adapt to missions without having to call back all the way to home base in Cedar Rapids, Iowa for us to make a code update for you. So I'm happy to do it, but I think there are more optimal ways to give that flexibility. And I think scalability is really key. Uh, the ability to work with different types of markets and, and different types of certification standards. Uh, for me, that picture on the right is, is my career. Uh, it is taking technology and sharing it between the business jet, the ground station, the urban air mobility type vehicle, and, and it's what I'm passionate about. So let me just finish up with just a couple thoughts, uh, and, and I think we'll get a lot of discussion here going in a moment. But uh, the Collins Aerospace perspective on, on this, on UAM and the fly orbs, it is a new and exciting dimension of air travel. Just go somewhere, if you live in Cedar Rapids, go somewhere with bad traffic once and you think, I can't wait. Um, I think how it can change, how our Air Force uh, can operate is incredible. There's momentum, obviously, uh, with all the people that are here today. I'm looking forward to, to hearing your questions, and, but we do have some regulati regulatory limits. Anyways, I think you get that at Collins, this is a priority for us. It is an area of incredible innovation. And, and I look forward to uh, all the new talent that comes in and brings new ways of thinking and new approaches. This is just a great and exciting area. Look forward to this panel. And thanks again to the Agility Prime. This has been an amazing virtual panel, well orchestrated. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jason. Next, we'll turn to Peter Schmidt from Transcend Air. Peter is the co-founder and COO of Transcend Air, is an entrepreneur, executive, a startup, turnaround, and large enterprise experience. His aviation roles have included a small UAS test pilot with two first flights, president and COO of Linear Air, Eclipse 500 operator, Part 135 online charter marketplace, COO of Jet Advisors, a business aviation consultancy, and SVP of the National Aviation Academy, one of the largest Part 147 aviation mechanic programs in the U.S. He's also an air aerobatic pilot. Schmidt holds the bat bachelor's in computer science and a master's in management from MIT. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Peter. Max, thank you very much. And I'd like to say thank you to Colonel Diller and all of the great people at uh, AFWorks and the Agility Prime team that's put this together. It's, uh, it's really exceptionally well done. Uh, and we're honored to participate. So as you can see on the first slide, uh, the title of my little talk here is VTOL Now, E When Ready. Um, in fact, that could be sort of the theme of our entire aircraft program. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we fit into what NASA is now terming advanced air mobility. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot about just urban air mobility, but uh, it turns out the world of VTOL is beyond the city limits. Um, and the part we're attacking is actually regional applications of VTOL transportation. So we do believe that we're developing aviation in a transformative, innovative manner. And so that uh, our aircraft, the VI-400, which you see pictured there, uh, does embody these AAM goals. Um, on the next slide, you can see where we plan to be in 2030. Uh, we plan to be operating an extensive route network of scheduled airline service from city to city across the United States. Uh, our aircraft's optimized for flights between 150 and 500 miles in length. And that's a market that's poised to see uh, a lot of growth with continuing population growth and increasing travel needs over time. So this aircraft is going to make for a more uh, convenient, faster intercity travel option. Uh, if we go to the next slide, how much faster? Well, uh, the top speed on this aircraft pencils out to 352 knots. So that's twice as fast as the top speed of helicopters. Uh, it climbs fast, um, and that's important because it gets up and out of earshot very quickly. Turns out to be very fuel efficient because of the wing. So at about the same size and power, it has half the fuel per kilometer of a Kiowa Warrior OH-58D. Uh, and simplicity has really been a key driving aspect of this design. So we target no hydraulics, a full fly-by-wire flight control system. We're using tilt wing, not a tilt rotor, so we don't have a complex rotor or cross-shafting or any of that. 
and a single turbine engine, which uh, also reduces complexity significantly. Uh, we project the aircraft should cost about three and a half million dollars in its base airliner trim. Um, and the most important thing here, I think, probably is that this design has carefully been put together to be future proof. So we do start out turbine mechanical to start, uh, but the way the aircraft's designed, we can electrify aircraft in the field when that great day comes. And so for this mission, unlike the orbs, which I picture sort of floating gently from a rooftop to another rooftop across the city, this aircraft's designed to be a bullet. It's designed to go really fast from one city to another. And um, what drives this design is actually my background that Max said in my bio a little bit. Um, I may be the only person uh, speaking to you uh, throughout this process that's actually had to run a part 135 charter operator and try to make money with aircraft at this scale. So I lived through the VLJ, the very light jet era uh, and saw its disappointments. I've watched the LSA era, the light sport aircraft era and seen its disappointments. And so I would say with regard to Mike Hirschberg's hype cycle, um, our program is trying to avoid that peak of inflated expectations and tunnel right through to the trough of realism. Um, and that's driven by what he said is even more important than Lillian Thal's flying is everything. Commercially viable and successful business model is really everything. And we have identified this city to city mission as one that this aircraft can do uh, for lower prices door to door than Ubers plus airline tickets today. So that's the key to the to the really driving the success of this. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'm not gonna talk about everything on here. This just gives you a little bit more idea of the configuration. Um, this tilt wing configuration was flown successfully in the 1960s with the Canada Air CL84. Uh, we've taken that idea and refined it. Um, if you go to slide six, you can see how this aircraft compares to existing tilt rotors. Now again, unlike the tilt rotor, the tilt wing is mechanically much simpler. Um, and so we've targeted simplicity, reliability, maintainability, interoperability with existing aircraft. Since it starts out as jet fuel powered, uh, you don't have to have a whole separate infrastructure to work with it. Um, affordability, uh, I think Colonel Diller said aircraft cost by the pound. And when you do a comparison, $3.5 million for a single engine turboprop fits right in with the cost of single engine helicopters and light turboprops. Um, adaptability, uh, it's occurred to us through this AFWorks process that uh, there may be options to militarize the aircraft. And upgradability, I talked about how we've designed it to be electrified in the day when electrical systems advance to the point of supporting our mission. Um, if we go to slide seven, you'll see some of the associated technology we're looking at. Our entire focus is getting a profitable business up and running as soon as possible. And so as part of that, we had to not only design the aircraft, we also had to look at the infrastructure. And what you see here is our concept design for a mobile barge-based floating vertipad uh, that's solar powered, has built-in runoff capture. So no gray water, no spilled fuel, no spilled oil, no de-ice fluid will make it into the, into the harbor that it's moored in. Um, we wanna make it crash and hurricane proof. Uh, and it results in a modular distributed, and as I said, mobile infrastructure for operating the aircraft. One of the cool features that comes with our partnership with Lily Helipads is built-in whole pad LED lighting. So you can see how their, uh, the actual name of the landing pads is lit up on those, on those pads. And of course, integrated fueling and fire suppression built right in. Um, so it's all about safety, and it's all about practicality. We can build this exact design today out of existing components. And similarly with the aircraft, we've tried to take a very high TRL approach, um, where if you go to look at slide eight, we define this aircraft as a next generation tilt wing VTOL with a high technology readiness level, uh, powered with a turboshaft engine to start, uh, but that's electrifiable, which makes it future-proof and affordable. And so really in this panel, I think we represent the customer perspective for these subsystems. We've looked at, the technology for distributed flight control systems, fly-by-wire, uh, envelope protection, ultimately mission protection. We've looked at advances in structures. We've looked at electric power motors. We've done the trade studies and we've arrived at our configuration as being optimal to start for our mission profile, which as I said, is a bullet, not an orb. Um, and our goal is to work with aerospace OEM partners and potentially you know, United States Air Force. Uh, to get a full-scale proof of concept up flying uh, as soon as we possibly can. Um, and if things go very well, we would hope to have entry into service in 2025. 
So if you go to slide nine, I'll just conclude by saying we view this aircraft as disruptive capability uh, that can be soonest deployed uh, with a secure electric future. Um, and I'm looking forward to participating in the panel and, and offering some more of our thoughts um, on what these key technology challenges are that will let us advance into this electric future we all envision. So thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. Next, we're going to turn to two speakers from Honeywell. First is Hector Garcia, who serves as the Chief Technology Officer of the Unmanned Aerial Systems and Urban Air Mobility Organization. He leads a highly motivated and skilled engineering team in developing and integrating innovative, safe, and cost-effective technologies across the entire UAS and UAM ecosystem. He brings all of Honeywell's technologies and capabilities to the business and general aviation, air transport and regional, and defense and space industries, the UAS and UAM, to the onboard vehicle systems, airspace, and ground operations for this new industry. Hector, over to you. Thank you, Max. And I'm very pleased uh, to be here to represent Honeywell to discuss uh, the technologies as an enabler for this very exciting market. I'm sure everybody is uh, as excited and energized as Honeywell is for the future of flight in this wonderful um, new era that we're in. I'd like to uh, discuss at Honeywell, um, we are leveraging our safe and reliable certified products from both the commercial and defense industries, and we're converting them into smaller form factors applicable for this market space, where we need the smaller, um, more efficient, less power consumpting products for this industry. And Honeywell is committed to this environment. Um, Honeywell has a very large number of technologies and services, both in electronics and mechanical systems. Today, I don't, with the time limitations that we have, I'm going to focus on two key technology areas that Honeywell brings that will enable, enable this market both in the small uh, unmanned air um, vehicle tech areas and also in the larger uh, human air transportation. So I'll start off with our detection and avoidance area in where we provide sensors in forms of um, converting our technologies and many years of experience that we have into a digital phased array that is a small form factor suitable for all of this environment. And with that sensor, we incorporate the technologies that we have learned through our rich history and using algorithms for the avoidance. So we can command and control the flight controls on these vehicles to do safe maneuvers, which is important, um, not only to detect, uh, detect and predict with um, learned machine language as to what is ahead of us, what potentially can conflict with us in the airspaces that we are traveling in. Um, so we are very um, focused on making sure that we used all the experience that we have in our industries in the certified world with design assurance and apply the proper levels to this industry. We want to be very cost centric. We don't want to produce an unaffordable market system here. We know the cost implications for all of our partners and OEMs we deal with. So we are very sensitive to that and we're enabling those technologies to be there for us. Um, the second key technology that Honeywell brings to this environment is around simplified vehicle operations. You've heard the terminology used. The one product for us that enables this capability is our compact fly-by-wire. We have taken the flight controls knowledge that we have learned and have um, for hundreds of thousands of hours in air transport, and we've made this into a compact form factor. So that is the brains of the technology for simplified vehicle operations, where we integrate the vehicle management systems with the compact fly-by-wire to make it safe, and most importantly, to be able to enable the future of flight in this area. So we simplify the vehicle operations where the flight controls are able to limit and govern safe attitudes and prohibit unsafe attitudes or positions that would normally cause catastrophic environment or conditions in the airspace. So our technologies, we're leveraging from all that we bring in from our certified world, and we're committed to serving this industry to make it the success that it will and soon to be. So um, 
with that, um, I want to end with the fact that, um, you know, technology today is an enabler. We have to work on the regulations and legislations to enable these technologies and apply the correct design assurance levels in the areas that are suited for um, higher integrity areas like our flight control systems. And be careful not to assess those assessments into other areas. With that, Max, I'll turn it over to you so we can go over to my colleague, Mark. Thanks so much. And really appreciate your, your comments there, Hector. And I think you gave a quick brief preview of what our panel questions are going to focus on. With that, I want to, I want to call on Mark Hedden, who's a 20-year Air Force veteran at Honeywell and currently works at Honeywell. While he was in the Air Force, he was an EWO, NAV, and CSO on the EC-130H, MC-130H, and U-28 aircraft. And hopefully I got all those right. He managed operations for C4 ISR defensive systems and worked within Air Force Special Operations Command on tactical ISR command and control, special operations mobility requirements. Since retiring in 2017, Mark is a senior solutions architect for Honeywell Connected Enterprise, where he looks at ways to adapt Honeywell commercial technologies into defense. Mark, over to you. Hey, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for Julie to Primer having us on. Yeah, so I want to extend something beyond what uh, Hector was talking about with regards to, it, it's kind of in the regulatory area. Um, but so if you extend this into the combat battle space and, and, and look at how we manage assets within the combat airspace, um, typically you get this you know, separation of uh, army assets or rotor wing tactical UAS uh, operations that are happening at a state 3,000 feet. AGL and below, and then you get all the fixed wing aircraft above that. Um, and there's always conflicts or friction areas between those two and how you actually manage that airspace. Uh, and then you also have, you know, other assets that, you know, are ground to ground that may extend to that fixed wing airspace. And there's always, and then you get the convergence areas where you have the actual airports themselves. Um, so one of the things we're going to have to really look at and that I look at uh, all the time is like in the combat airspace, typically right now we do procedural deconfliction or deconfliction by exception. Um, and so you got to look at it, you know, and that's what I'm doing within Honeywell is looking at those technologies that allow active deconfliction uh, between assets and how you're going to manage those assets within those particular airspaces. Uh, and if you extend that into the civilian sector, it's sort of the difference between NHSTA and FAA. Uh, right now, um, the, the highway guys, two-dimensional plane, surface of the earth, and anything above that is FAA. Uh, but pretty soon, you're going to have urban air mobility. You're going to have a whole fleet of UASs. Uh, in that, you're going to have the traditional rotor wing assets that are going to be extending uh, you know, through that particular airspace. And, uh, and it's going to produce a very congested environment where procedural deconfliction is not going to be uh, a way to deconflict that airspace from a safety standpoint. Uh, so one of the things I've been looking at, you know, is what kind of technologies do we need for that? So Hector brought up detect and avoid. Um, we're also looking at communication systems that extend beyond where traditional 4G and 5G uh, technologies exist. You know, a lot of our combat airspaces, there is no infrastructure, you know, cell phone infrastructure out there to allow command and control or uh, deconfliction and communication of those assets. So how are you going to do that? Well, you might have to leverage onto SpaceX. Uh, they're, um, they're launching their, you know, space space internet, you know, all around the world or one web, uh, MRSAT, L-band or Iridium systems. Um, <clears throat> and looking at those particular communication systems allow the extension of that active deconfliction, active communication um, and interconnectedness of that ecosystem is going to develop in those low air spaces. Uh, with that, I'll hand it back to the panel so we can get into the questions. Thanks so much. And I'd ask all of our panelists to put their video back on so that we can begin discussion here around the panel. I really want to look at a first question, maybe Jason, over to you on this. That I think a lot of times people say that the technology is already there for this, for UAM and, and kind of AAM missions, while also looking at kind of the realities of the development cycle takes time. As we peel that back a little bit, where are some of the two or three technologies that you see might still need a little bit of development as well as where um, we need to advance advance the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think the perception sensing is just one of those key areas, uh, especially when we think a little bit about how things move forward. When we start off, we create a vehicle that's uh, piloted 
that may be easier to fly. So the flight controls, that's a huge step forward. Now we want to bring in the automations and we want it to be possible so that not everybody needs to have that $200,000 uh, pilot's license, or at least that's what it cost maybe 20 years ago. So it's probably even worse now. Um, and so to that, I think perception sensing is going to be a really key aspect. That'll be perception in ways uh, that we don't do as much today in aviation, visual perception and other things electronically, a and having the data lakes and the data and the information to be able to analyze that and turn that into uh, computing solutions that can get us there to features like automated takeoff and landing, to features like uh, automated ground operations, some of that stuff on the edge that we might not think of right away of just flying from point A to point B. That's really the critical pieces today in our operations. I think when you look at that all, you also need the ability to communicate back with the system. And, and so certified comms, things that we can trust that the message that goes back and forth between uh, whatever ground or infrastructure that's in place so that we trust that there are the existing mops, but we need to bring the technology forward for that. So I believe those are kind of two of the, a, a couple of the biggest critical technologies, but that whole process of doing that needs to be high integrity, things that we can trust and have assurance over. Thanks, Jason. Really appreciate that insight. Um, Hector and Mark, from the Honeywell perspective, as companies that are actively developing these technologies as well, how do you see the development cycle playing out? And, and if we're truly ready with the technologies today or what's some where we may need to focus a little bit more on? Thanks, Max. I'll, I'll, I'll give the first response and then hand it over to Mark. The development cycles from a technology perspective, as I stated earlier, we are leveraging our certified products today. So the conversion over into small form factors, we've already had the proven high integrity where it needs to be for all the design assurance levels. What we're trying to do is to make sure that they're appropriate in the right areas. For example, let's make sure that we keep the high integrity in the flight controls and the fly-by-wire, the things that are critical for flight. But as we make that expansion into the rest of the avionics suite or mechanical areas and stuff, we have to be careful to make sure that we don't apply over rigor that we used to do in part 25, part 27. Otherwise, these vehicles will not be affordable. We still do them safe and reliable if we do the design assurance correctly. So from a development cycle perspective from Honeywell um, Max, we are there already. We are providing a lot of our customers and partners with um, demonstration phased um, products today. Um, and so where the advancement and development cycles are, efforts or long-term is in the automation areas that um, we already heard are going to take some time to get some regulations around. Mark, anything to add? Yeah, the, the, one of the things I've been looking at too is, you know, it's kind of the distinction between how we handle highway safety and FAA. I mean, FAA has a really long history, a solid history of producing safe uh, vehicles. I mean, it's incredible how safe the airline industry is today. Um, but I'm not sure that rigor that goes into FAA certified vehicles is necessarily warranted for these type of vehicles. I mean, we do need that high integrity, um, you know, safety aspects and reliability of those systems. But, you know, the cost points, I mean, the amount of money it takes to produce an aircraft is, is astronomical compared to the how much we're going to be spending on these vehicles. Um, now, the off scale, i.e. total numbers is going to be there. Uh, but we got to kind of, I think there's going to have to be a balance uh, in how we actually manage those certifications and, and the cycle you know, and the type of development that needs to go into that. Max, can I talk to that real quick? Please, oh yes. I think we heard the FAA today, today say that they uh, wanted to start with the process of operate first and regulate later. But um, I also heard them say that obviously safety continues to be paramount. So I think there's a, there's a roadmap here where you have to start out with uh, perhaps a higher level of regulation and more expensive certification uh, and evolve the solutions over time. That's certainly what we're planning on. Um, you know, our aircraft price point would support uh, regular kinds of cost for certification and for the um, fly-by-wire flight goals and the sensors and the integration and the software. So that's part of our bet is that we can get started with something that uh, will work under the current regime but be a stepping stone from a platform perspective 
to what Mark's talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that segues nicely into what some of the things Dr. Winter was talking about earlier on engine design and engine um, innovations. Can you talk a little bit about where we are in the current state and, and kind of where you see us going as it is to EVTOL battery technologies and what you're looking at at Pratt and Whitney? Sure. So starting starting just with the last comment, I mean, that's the beauty. I, I just want to uh, add something to the last point, and that is the beauty of partnership with DOD and the opportunity to potentially introduce this in the battle space lets us insert it in, in, an op, in an operating theater where perhaps there's a different risk tolerance model, and that will allow us to even more rapidly transition it. And then when you look at the propulsion to answer your question, um, the battery and electric motor, uh, the motors, the controllers, the distribution, we're working on that together with our partners, our sister division at Collins Aerospace. And that's being developed for a wide range of applications from large aircraft in partnership with NASA. We're actively working on that all the way down to the smaller scale for a number of other opportunities and applications. So starting with the battery or very low range of the payload, you can do that today. Coupling that with a thermal engine, there's an opportunity to make those thermal engines even more efficient. And as the volumes come to, to play, that'll enable uh, new technologies to be inserted at an appropriate price point. We're also looking at uh, new technologies that might also be applicable for uh, APUs all the way out to fuel cell technology. So lots of opportunities, lots of exciting uh, forefront to go explore. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And I'll um, take a question from the audience now that we received and open it up to anyone on the panel to respond. How has the advent of connected systems enhanced system design? And how have more advanced fly-by-wire and engine technologies further accelerated the VTOL market? Lots to unpack there, but I think it does raise a lot of good points about some of the innovations that we can leverage from existing aviation and how we can use them to kind of capitalize on the market. So, so I can start out. Um, the, the, the focus on going to serial hybrid, which it adds weight, it adds cost, it adds complexity, but it also introduces the opportunity for redundancy. And it introduced the opportunity for new vehicle and multi-propulsor designs. And we've seen this in a lot of the eVTOL concepts already, where there's perhaps multiple motors with one power source or multiple power source with a duplicit uh, redundancy, essentially, for safety. And that, that opportunity really that, that gives us that redundancy, gives us the opportunity to introduce this that we never had before especially for new and novel aircraft concepts. Great. Thank you. Any, anybody else have any additional thoughts on that question? Well, I'm certainly looking forward to the innovations that companies like Collins and Honeywell are working on. We're counting on being able to use fly-by-wire flight control. Um, we're prototyping our own flight control laws and uh, software for that now. So we've achieved stability augmentation. We're working on envelope protection. We have a concept that I call mission protection, where you, where you, this is, gets to the connected, where you integrate sensor fusion and databases, detailed terrain and obstacle databases, and cryptographic security of the aircraft. So that aircraft is only going to fly the flight plan it's been programmed to, regardless of what an occupant does. You know, worst case, you can force an emergency landing to it. Um, I think that's an obvious step. But these are all steps, the progressions. And the key is, how do you phase it uh, effectively, so that you don't invest too much too soon and end up with the she vault, uh, or too much too late and miss the drone revolution and it all goes to China with DJI. Yeah, absolutely. And I think and, it, please go on. Oh, I was just going to say, just to think a little bit about what Peter was just saying, you know, I, I love that opportunity to eliminate some of the pilot workload around the flight controls so that we can do more amazing things with the avionics and the interconnected, what, what can be done. Right now that pilot is so busy, especially with most vertical flight aircraft helicopters, that's a hard aircraft to fly. We have to put a lot of limits in how we approach everything because of the way the operator interacts with the aircraft and all the difficulties there. So I think it's a great stepping stone to bring new and better technologies. And then I think to the other point about the interconnectedness and networking, it's, it's amazing what we can do when we're not stuck with just the computer hardware that's on the aircraft, when we can distribute. Yeah, and I think that's a good place to segue into another theme that we've seen from the polling questions is 
and maybe I'll ask our Honeywell friends first, but as we look at the traditional aviation supply chain, obviously it's a tiered supply chain, and we only have a few OEMs right now. Obviously, as we look at the future of this industry, we're going to have many OEMs. So how has it been working with some of the new, the new startups, newer entrants, and as well as the traditional aviation companies as we kind of embark on this new industry and any lessons learned or advice out there for some of the companies that might be looking to engage with you guys in the future? Max, let me take that first. And I think the big key thing is flexibility. Um, you know, the one thing that we've encountered with our new startup companies that we've been um, very um, grateful to be engaged with is, is that um, they're not used to working with a large company like a Honeywell and the logistics is, could be cumbersome. Uh, you need to be flexible. We provide um, different options for them. We, we're trying to simplify the point of contacts for them and also making sure that the price points are there for them. So uh, very interesting times. Uh, they're not used to um, you know, the aviation industry or the small quantities, but we have production capabilities to increase logistics and numbers to accommodate those areas. So flexibility is the number one thing working with uh, new players in this, in, in this market. And I think one of the other quandaries that is, that is gonna be encountered too is that you know, with this type of vehicle, you got to look at non-traditional technologies that you wouldn't necessarily apply to a flying vehicle. Um, so I'll take, you know, take, for example, um, you know, the, you have a, there's this huge trade-off with payload weight, et cetera. And it's very, it's a very similar trade-off to the UAS market, right? You got to get as small as possible, but still maintain the capability there. So you got to look at non-traditional means of doing that. Um, uh, or looking at the semi-autonomous vehicles uh, that are out there, which this is what Tesla has kind of put out. And how do I leverage a, a capability like that and extend it into an air vehicle, which is operating three-dimensional space as opposed to two-dimensional space? Um, and that's one of the things that we've, you know, especially for me, you know, where I'm looking at every single thing that Honeywell is doing, which is a huge portfolio. Um, and figuring out and picking out those things that I can take out and put into an air vehicle such as this, a UAS or an aircraft or into a military application. Uh, and you got to kind of think a little bit differently when you go do something like that. Uh, so the big thing is, is just getting with those particular contacts. Like Hector, he, he's one of our main guys in the UAM market, uh, UAM aspects, you know, finding those key contacts. And then from there, he can expand it out and see if there's some, you know, other ways to kind of skin the cat. So. At, I want to add to that, at Pratt Whitney and at our parent company, Raytheon Technologies, we're convinced we have the best engineers on the planet, but we have lots of great ideas, but maybe we don't have all of them. And one of the opportunities that's out there is especially through the SBIRs uh, to partner with uh, a number of the small businesses. And we actively work side by side with a number of small companies, especially as Dr. Roper was describing earlier in the week about the, the new opportunities to go really fast and they get awards sometimes in a day. That's, that's a speed and an agility that we often can't do on our own. It's a combination of the good ideas, the talent in the base, and, and really they have people and, and concepts and perhaps even funding in partnership with the government to go rapidly understand if those have merit and accelerate the TRL ascension. And Max, let, let me add something else too. Uh, just a compliment from the technology side of flexibility. So to some of the comments that Peter had made earlier, um, at Honeywell, we traditionally do the whole integration phase, complete product from, end, um, to, from start to end. Well, today, these technology companies, as you know, um, we've heard, we have intelligent engineers all over the world. Um, no one has the, you know, can claim, um, even though, um, you know, Michael could be certain that he has the most intelligent engineers, but, um, you know, these companies have intelligent engineers and they have their flight controls. They are able to, in our system, we, we are flexible enough to accommodate that and put the integrity around the rigor of their, of their flight controls so that their inner loops are actually their design. We actually provide the design assurance and the high integrity. So to like Peter's comment, we have all of our partners and, you know, these are unique vehicles, very specific and unique in their flight controls. They have the knowledge to do that. 
we incorporate, how do we bring in the safety and integrity into this airspace? So there's another, uh, another method, a little slight twist to what you were specifically asking, but uh, it addresses multiple needs there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Peter, I guess, just quickly, I know we're running out to short on time and want to get one more question in. But from the kind of operator side, as you guys look at dealing with some of these big companies, how have you found the process? Yeah, so, um, you know, these, these companies are sort of storied names to me, having been a pilot for these many years. Um, so it's been fun to get to know people inside. And, um, you know, I'm a startup guy, done a bunch of startups in my career. And uh, my biggest horror story so far is taking five months to get an NDA executed. Uh, <laughs> but once that was executed, I mean, we'd actually done several design spins in that time. But um, by the time it was done, uh, working internally, everybody has a sense of urgency and is working really hard and getting creative. And uh, you, I see that in working with these companies. Uh, from an operator perspective, our goal is to get this capability developed, uh, manufactured by somebody else, and operate it uh, and go make money off it. And we think we've identified a design that fits a sweet spot where we can do that. Um, and I think that's real, you know, that's the key to our approach from this. And I hope that everybody else out there who's working on a new vehicle is, is really sharpening their pencil and figuring out who's going to pay how much for what with that vehicle because that's what's going to ultimately decide who ships thousands of these and who just ends up with the prototype. Yeah, and I think we have time for one last question, and I think we could continue this discussion probably for another few hours. But I wanted to ask Nicole about uh, you reference additive manufacturing and new manufacturing techniques. Can you talk a little bit just about how you guys are leveraging it and what you're doing and the benefits you get from it? Sure, sure. So really the way to think about it is not just in, in the segment of the additive manufacturing, but it's in the entire model-based digital thread, right? You start with the engineers designing the concept, they do the aerodynamics, and then you go from there, and then uh, you get digital drawings, right? They're not real physical drawings. Actually cut any chips, you model the manufacturing process, regardless of whether it's traditional or additive, but you model the process so you understand the end result. You then couple it with your quality system so once you actually make the part, regardless of how it's made, you image, you snap it to the grid, and you use that for the qualification, not only in terms of form and fit, but go back to those aerodynamic models and actually look at the function, right? And then you sort of follow that all the way through. Now with additive manufacturing, that lets us go really fast. That's the key, because sometimes it would take uh, even years to produce um, the blanks and the tooling to actually get a part into the test stand. Well, with additive manufacturing, we've been able to achieve that in you know taking what used to take years and do that in a month to two months. And that's really that's really been profound in terms of helping us accelerate the development cycle and learn very quickly on a number of our current programs. Yeah, really appreciate that. And I think everyone probably has that story to tell, but I think we're, we're running up on time here. Yep, Max, you're exactly right. We are out of time. But please, do you want to wrap and summarize the panel and then we'll move? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, overall, a great conversation. I really appreciate all of our panelists' time. Um, I think a virtual round of applause is in order. They did great work, um, provided really good um, insights into some of the technology they're working on. And Again, I think we probably could have continued that for a few more hours. So really appreciate it. And um, again, we'll, we'll turn it back to you guys. So real quick uh, update. There were 245 people who took themselves away from the panel for a second to vote on the poll. And proud to share with you that for the risks, for the greatest challenge for widespread use of orbs, the number one vote is infrastructure is the biggest risk. A tie for two and three is regulation and culture and bringing up the end is workforce at 5%. Interesting results. I'm sure those uh, we did allow multiple voting. So perhaps people change their mind over the course of the panel, but thanks again for a great panel. Nate, over to you for the next session. Yeah, Max, thanks so much to your team, uh, folks that presented here this afternoon and for the great partnership with AIA. I'm going to transition over now to our next speaker, Ben Marcus of AirMap. He's the co-founder and chairman of AirMap. It's actually the second company that he has founded. Uh, really leading thinker on airspace management. And Ben is here with us this afternoon as a pilot of over 4,500 hours, 
and as I said, the thought leader in many ways on what the world looks like when we have hundreds or maybe thousands of these vehicles over flying. A lot of people have we just heard the whole concerns about culture, but I think what Ben is going to show you is a future where there's actually a, an easy, not an easy, it's very difficult, but there's a path that allows us to manage the track in a very intelligent way, an efficient way, a way that ensures safety. Before he does that, he's got some other speakers here with him that are going to talk a little bit about how we can leverage the fantastic experience that's already been developed in the small UAS industry. And you heard this yesterday. This is something that the FAA has done. It's something that the, the administration has echoed through the IP movement as an opportunity to start thinking differently about this advanced air mobility and leveraging the work with these small aircraft that will eventually allow us to actually have human operations in these condensed, uh, in these very dense environments. And I'll let you go ahead and introduce the last panel for this afternoon and looking forward to seeing some of the outstanding examples that you have allow us to peer into this future for future traffic. Great, uh, thank you, Nate. And um, thank you to Dr. Roper and everybody else that has uh, organized uh, this Agility Prime launch event. Congratulations on a fantastic week thus far. Um, the Agility Prime initiative is you know, precisely the kind of uh, public-private partnership that will drive American leadership in this transformative technology and, and truly bring life-changing services to people all around the world. I'm gonna share a uh, deck quickly here. All right. So um, in a moment, as Nate said, I'll be joined by uh, three esteemed guests who are going to talk about how they're using drones today to deliver value. Um, those guests include uh, John Roberts, who is the executive vice president and chief operating officer of CVS. And he'll talk about how CVS is using drones to deliver medications to customers. Basil Yap will describe how the state of North And John Anders will join us to describe how drones are transforming the construction industry. Uh, fundamentally, the system of systems that will ultimately allow orbs to fly at scale is being built today by these operational use cases. But before we welcome those guests, I'd just like to give you a little bit of context. So I grew up in one of the most congested cities in the United States, Los Angeles. And over the years, the commute time for many people living in Los Angeles has grown to as much as 90 minutes each way to get to work. Well, Los Angeles didn't always look like that. In uh, 1924, this is what Los Angeles looked like. And in fact, just outside where I'm sitting today is the Santa Monica Airport where these Douglas World Cruisers took off and became the first airplanes to fly around the world. Over the course of the next 30 years or so, the aerospace innovators created uh, incredible new aircraft innovations, ultimately leading to the jet airliner, which now connect people and goods all around the world. Now, a new generation of aircraft are being born. Electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft hold this tremendous promise to bring quiet and efficient transport uh, for people in and around cities. But this innovation in these aircraft designs alone will not increase the daily benefit brought to people without accompanying innovation in the physical and digital infrastructure uh, to support high scale operations. As the, the uh, poll from the last panel indicated, Infrastructure is the key to building this future. Um, and today what we're gonna talk about is the digital infrastructure to create that future. The air traffic control system today in the United States can support about 45,000 daily airline flights. It's a almost entirely manual and analog process. Um, it requires about 15,000 dedicated air traffic control professionals to fly 45,000 flights a day. Um, that system simply will not scale and is not safe enough to handle millions of daily flights that we expect orbs to make. I routinely fly around Los Angeles in small airplanes and helicopters, and I can tell you that as it is with the 15 or 20 helicopters that we have flying over LA at any given time, seeing a void in visual flight conditions is not 
that safe. If we were to add even just another 20 aircraft to, to the skies over LA, um, sea and avoid definitely would not be safe enough. And if it's a cloudy day and we're flying under instrument flight rules and depending on air traffic controllers, you know, even just another 10 aircraft uh, departing and arriving at small airports in Los Angeles could bring the whole air traffic control system here to a standstill. What we need is a digital and automated system that leverages modern technologies, all the while enhancing the level of safety that aviation already enjoys. So uh, before we turn it over to uh, our guests, let me just walk you through um, what we see as the automation roadmap for this industry. Um, in, in, in our view, this sort of boom took off around 2015 with recreational drones. What once was a tool that only militaries could enjoy with $50 million, now anybody could enjoy for about $500. You just have to visit your local electronic shop. And what made that possible was technologies coming from uh, mobile phones and cloud computing and so forth. Over the last few years, enterprises have figured out how to use those same drones for their business use cases. Um, now we're moving into a semi-autonomous operations uh, era where drones are being used for things like industrial inspection and package delivery um, in, in a monitored but highly automated way. The next step is going to be more autonomy. Um, so people won't need to own drones, they won't need to care about a drone, they won't need to know how to fly a drone. They'll simply need to have some uh, demand for data or goods that a, a drone can deliver to them they make the request, the drone is automatically dispatched, flies the mission and delivers that data or those kids. And ultimately we'll get to a future where orbs and advanced aerial mobility can really happen at scale once the public is comfortable with autonomy in the airspace. So now I'd like to go ahead and welcome um, John Roberts, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of CVS. And he'll describe how CVS is using drones to deliver to their customers. A couple quick fun facts about John. Um, he started his career at CVS as a pharmacist and he is also an accomplished pilot. So John, take it away. Um, ben, how you doing? Can you hear me? I, I can't get my camera to work, but. Yeah, we can hear you, John, go ahead. Okay, okay, hi everybody. Um, let me maybe start with just a, a little bit about CVS Health. Um, so there's really three businesses that we operate. We are best known as, uh, as owning the 10,000 CVS pharmacies across the country. Um, and we've been able to keep those open during these challenging times to provide products and services. Uh, we also have a uh, prescription benefit management company called Caremark that manages the prescription benefits for um, 90 million Americans uh, across the country. And we support employers and health plans and the government in managing those benefits. And then we have Aetna, which is a health plan I'm sure most of you have, have heard about. But CVS is committed to being part of delivering the future of healthcare. And that's why we were excited to be working with UPS to explore prescription medication delivery options via drone technology. And we're always looking to improve convenience for customers through faster, lower cost, and more efficient delivery models. So we're exploring many types of delivery options from urban, probably more challenging, but you know we see opportunities for suburban and, and definitely for rural. And we especially see um, potential for drone delivery in communities where life-saving medications are needed and consumers at times cannot conveniently access one of our stores or other pharmacies. So let me share maybe a brief overview of our collaboration. So on October uh, 21st of last year, UPS and CVS announced our agreements to explore a variety of drone delivery use cases. UPS already has an extensive, has extensive experience transporting medical samples and supplies, including making more than 1500 drone deliveries to the Wakefield or to the Wake Med Hospital campus in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And, and that's been going on since March of last year. And we're proud to be the first retail health company to explore drone delivery options with UPS. And we actually did our first residential drone delivery of prescription medicines in November of this past year. So that flight launched from a CVS store in Cary, North Carolina and flew to 
uh, a customer's home. Uh, the deliveries were completed, as you can imagine, from start to finish in just a couple of minutes. The drones flew autonomously. They were monitored by a remote operator who could intervene if necessary. Uh, it hovered about 20 feet over the, the front yard and lowered the package by a cable and winch to the ground. And it was delivered to one of our customers who has limited mobility themselves, and it makes it difficult for them to travel to the store to pick up the prescription. So this drone delivery, the first of its kind in the industry, demonstrates what's possible for our customers who can't easily make it into our stores. And then on Monday of this week, and you may have, have seen it on uh, actually made national news, UPS and CVS announced that we're going to use drones to deliver prescription medicines from a CVS pharmacy to the villages in Florida. And the villages is the largest retirement community in the country, home to more than 135,000 residents. And this latest drone delivery service will help us provide safe and efficient delivery of medicines, enabling residents of the villages to receive those meds without leaving their homes. So this is an option many residents could benefit from, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. And while these first flights will be less than a half mile, it'll be delivered uh, to a location near the retirement community. And initially a ground vehicle will complete the delivery of the residents' doors. We're still in the early stages of this collaboration, but we'll continue to take a test and learn approach to help us scale up this option for more of our patients and customers. So, you know, we're very excited about this. I think what's, what's interesting is during this pandemic, we've seen a significant uh, off the charts increase in, in uh, interest for home delivery of pharmacy. So, you know, we, we think drones is, is gonna be one of, uh, one of the ways to make that happen. Great, thank you very much, John. We appreciate uh, you and, and all of the CVS uh, teammates that, that are supporting the community through this health crisis. Thanks for all that you're doing. Absolutely. Um, next up, we'd like to uh, welcome Basil Yap. Basil is the UAS Program Manager for the State of North Carolina's Department of Transportation. Basil, take it away. Great, thank you for, uh, for the in invitation and opportunity to speak a little bit about um, how North Carolina Department of Transportation was able to use um, UAS or drones through actually a variety of, of hurricane responses, um, starting with Hurricane Florence. Uh, I'll note that we've been very fortunate in North Carolina to have um, both legislative leadership as well as our, our department leadership focused on UAS and, and drones and and really kind of viewing uh, drones as a um, another mode of transportation. And so the, the DOT is very interested in how do we safely integrate these into the skies above North Carolina. Uh, we're, we're fortunate to be partnered under the integration pilot program. We lead our, our participation in that and have partners like we just heard UPS um, and, and CVS and, and others flying in our state. And I think the leadership role we've been playing has, has really been uh, led by the adoption of UAS within a department use. How, how does the DOT use drones? And that knowledge has then kind of expanded our thought about how we can be using drones in, in other uh, spaces. So um, I'm excited to kind of share a little bit about how we were able to use UAS to gather critical information uh, prior to a hurricane response, and also um, also after, during a hurricane and then afterwards. So uh, there have been three hurricanes over the past um, few years that we've used UAS to respond to, and each are obviously unique. Um, but Hurricane Florence was where we gathered really the most information. We, we were cutting our teeth, so to speak, in, in that particular event, but we flew over 260 missions uh, with drones, and we had 15 teams deployed. And so we, we gathered over 8,000 videos and images that helped, again, our leadership, our engineers, and other stakeholders from the emergency management to FEMA, to the Coast Guard, et cetera, to really um, to make those decisions on how to allocate resources in, in response. And so, um, again, Hurricane Michael came through, and then just this past fall, we were able to use drones for Hurricane Dorian, which really impacted the, the coast or the outer banks of our, of our state. Um, 
So when we look at you know UAS and using it as a tool, it's important to be able to create a workflow um, that captures the required information, uh, you know, images, video, et cetera, so that the, the team that's leading the emergency response has the necessary information, again, to, to focus on that response effort. And so it's, it's a tool that's being used for situational awareness. And I'll mention first uh, just how we use it as a tool, and then I'll mention second about how we incorporated this tool into that airspace. Um, and so what you see here is a diagram of the process, the loop, so to speak, of ingesting mission requests from a variety of different groups, whether it's at a local level, uh, folks that are in the field using phones and using the lat logs of those locations, uh, to others that know that there are sites that they would like to uh, have flown. For example, uh, pig waste, hog waste lagoons. I did not know that that was an issue, but in a flooding event after a hurricane, there's, uh, there's a concern that those could flood. And so using drones for that particular mission was something we, we were doing. In addition to monitoring traffic uh, for first responders to get into those impacted areas, as well as folks that were trying to get out of the evacuated from those impacted areas. And with flooding and, um, and other damage to our, our transportation corridors, we were able to use these new traffic cams, so to speak, flying traffic cams to gather that crucial information. And so again, it was a great tool that we we're able to use to capture this data. But again, we're flying in, a, uh, in an airspace now that is saturated with low altitude or low level helicopter traffic. And so this created a, a really unique situation for us. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll see how we're able to use AirMap as a tool um, in really all three of these events that I mentioned. And so during an emergency response, if the state goes into a state of emergency, uh, the governor's office is taking over that emergency response. And so in North Carolina, the Department of Public Safety has an emergency management group that helps manage that. Um, all of the all of the different operations and logistics and resources, and they're working closely with the local um, incident commanders and emergency management groups, whether at a county or municipality level. Uh, and so, what we did is we worked closely with them to uh, to be embedded with the air operations cell. And so, these folks are already coordinating with Coast Guard, Air National Guard, uh, Customs and Border Patrol. We're flying in this airspace, Civil Air Patrol all these different aviation assets, uh, medevac flights, uh, utility and, and, infra and energy um, helicopter operations. Uh, we all needed to fly together in these, in these environments and impacted areas. And so with that, we communicated to, or we asked some of the concerns from helicopter operators, other uh, fixed wing operators around uh, the use of drones. And they, their concern was understanding where these missions were taking place so they could better uh, plan their own missions, um, but also be aware that there were operations taking place once they got in the air. And so what we did is we used this dashboard here and in all of our 16 teams, uh, as I mentioned, and so example, Hurricane Florence, all 260 missions that we conducted, um, they were using this, this uh, air map app and uploading their, uh, their position during those flights to a dashboard. And this provided situational awareness for the air operations cell to understand where these operations were taking place. It provided a situational awareness platform for us as the, the UAS command center to understand when our folks got to the field, when the missions were being conducted and when we could um, expect the data and photos and videos that were so crucial to the response to come back. And the beauty of this particular platform is we're able to incorporate it in FAA swim data. So we could, we had data um, from the, from man traffic that were in the area. And, uh, and so that was very crucial. We, the map you see there um, is highlighting the man traffic that's taking place. And so that helped us understand, um, again, where the operations were, uh, where we could conduct operations safely, provide a, a level of safety and, and confidence in our uh, helicopter and fixed wing pilots that are operating and really allowed us to share that airspace safely. And I think that's the key of, of any 
uh, emergency response, especially using UAS. Great, thank you so much, Basil. We uh, appreciate you joining us and appreciate uh, your leadership you're demonstrating there in, in North Carolina. Um, next up, we've got uh, John Anders from Anders Construction. And uh, John, just take a couple minutes if you would to tell us a little bit about how you're using drones in construction. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ben. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm located in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we've been using drones for about four years on our, on our projects. Um, basically, you know, there's three main uses that we have in construction, uh, pre-construction, progress capture, and our safety inspections. Uh, with pre-construction, you know, we can't ever just assume uh, what the site conditions are on, on, a, on a piece of dirt, um, you know, just based on Google imagery. Uh, we like to go out there and have new capture out there that we can use for logistics planning. That way we can make sure that uh, we're using the proper roads and entryways uh, to bring material um, like concrete trucks and stuff and staging. Um, then we have progress capture. Uh, that's kind of the obvious one uh, where we can you know, view and document our progress along the, the job site. Uh, the important part here is that uh, this used to be a manual process uh, that people would take pictures on their phones or cameras um, and they would be done from the same place each time. And it was just very um, convoluting. Uh, now we can, though, with this progress capture, we can compare our, our scheduled activities with what's actually going on on site. Um, you know, using Air Maps platform, we're allowed to uh, basically do uh, takeoffs of square footage so we can compare a week ago to what it is this week. Um, and that helps us ensure that we're going to be staying on schedule um, to turn you know, a project in on time. Uh, and then safety is a really big one. Um, you know, right now, our guys, or I guess previously, our uh, safety guys would go around and they'd have to walk the entire building to make sure that all the safety rails were up in every single window before a window was up in place. Um, and that's able to be done very, very fast now, uh, which is, uh, you know, critical to a job site and ensuring safety on a job site, um, making sure that everything is done at the same time rather than having to pass by each thing manually. Uh, is a big, big change. Um, and then exterior inspections on high rises and just buildings in general. Um, the less people we have to have hanging off the side of a building on a swing stage or you know up in a piece of machinery uh, looking at something uh, that could be done just with a drone is always going to be better. Um, let's go to the next side. So uh, how drones have changed construction. Um, Pretty much, they're more precise than uh, before. You know, previously we had helicopters fly all of our job sites, and they'd come around and take pictures once a month. Uh, the hard part with that was, you know, what are we doing with that with that data? We're, it's basically just a picture to show us progress. Uh, every time they came, they would give us a different photo, a different angle of that job site. Uh, and now, you know, because drones are much more precise, we're able to use GPS and have mission plannings. So we're flying that same flight each time around our job site. This gives us much more accuracy to where we're able to, you know, inspect things from the same place each time, compare a picture from one date to another to see what differences went along there. Uh, and we're able to actually push this into our BIM models uh, to see, you know, so we can better clash and coordinate our construction projects. Uh, you know, drones allow for more capture than before. Uh, just the nature of a drone, like you said earlier, Ben, you know, being a $500 item now that anyone can go get at the store, you know, we can have them on more of our projects and that means our capture is uh, more frequent. So uh, that, that more frequent data is allowing us to make better data-driven decisions on our projects. Um, so things like, are we on schedule? You know, we can... We can do those takeoffs, figure out our quantities, know that we're on schedule. Um, you know, we can make decisions on do we need to have more safety rails because of uh, the data that we're seeing. Um, and then they allow us to go places that we normally don't go before. Uh, and that's really, uh, I think, a key one. Uh, you know, with these, these inspections off the side of a building, 
you know, it's very hard to know where you are if you're hanging off the side of a building, you know, and know where uh, that problem could occur. Uh, and now with having an image, you know, you're always able to back up, see where you're at, know where that problem is and go back and fix it. Um, and it's just putting less people in danger. I think that's a, a really key thing for us. Hey guys, this Great. has been a fantastic presentation. Just want to let you know our, our YouTube live stream, stream audience with uh, over, it looks like over a thousand people watching this are expecting it to end in about three minutes. So we want you to get through to the main points right here so we can Perfect. wrap this sucker up. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was planning on showing a bunch of demos, but we, uh, we've we got a limited time. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and uh, uh, get, to the, get to the bottom line here, which is that... Um, Ultimately, well, first of all, if you guys want to see more of these demos, just give me a call. I'm happy to, happy to show you one-on-one -on -one at any time. Um, but uh, what I want to say is I'm extremely proud of, of the AirMap team for uh, all that they have done in, in leading the development of this uh, transformative technology, unmanned traffic management and airspace operations management. Last year, uh, the AirMap team was uh, voted by Fast Company as one of the top 10 most innovative transportation companies of uh, of 2019, so we're very proud of that. You know, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go, and this requires partnership. And so, I want to encourage anybody that's tuning in today uh, to reach out if you're interested in partnering with us. You're interested in helping us advance these technologies and making them um, useful and valuable for uh, the future of advanced aerial mobility. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, thanks again to uh, Colonel Diller and to Dr. Roper and everybody else for uh, organizing, and congratulations on a, on a great week. Thanks, Ben. That was that was great, and the whole list of guests was fantastic as well. Nate, anything else for Ben that you want to cover or see before we wrap this up? No, I know Ben has some fantastic demos, and again, is really doing some great work actually already with the Army right now on a project that he has going. And I don't know, Ben, if are you are you participating at all in the virtual booths on Friday? I should know the answer to that. Uh, uh, if, I don't, if not, I, we I don't I don't believe we're currently planning to, but but uh, since we kind of rushed through these uh, demos, we we can certainly do that uh, on Friday if people are interested in seeing it. Yeah, Ben, I think that would be great. Uh, we'll connect with you afterwards to make sure you get a booth there. Uh, it's going to be two hours in the morning and two hours midday, so plenty of time for people to come in and see all those details. Uh, sorry, you had to miss some of them this afternoon. No uh, Nate, before you give us the details of tomorrow, just a couple of logistical things. One, there is a poll that is live on the screen right now. You can tell us how we're doing on the day uh, to make sure that we're adapting and innovating through this, uh, well, everybody broadcasting from home. How about that? Uh, we'd love your feedback. Uh, we also, tomorrow, there is the networking again. This one is focused on uh, students and individuals combined with government. It's set to be another great opportunity. Please look for those links in chat, Slack, YouTube, and on the website. Uh, we always try to hit you up with multiple things at one time. Uh, and also a, another plug for Ben and the others that will be doing the trade show on Friday. Once again, the trade show on Friday is going to start at 9 to 11 Eastern and also from 1 to 3. So plenty of time to go in and see these amazing folks working on building the future of orbs. Nate, you want to tell us about the details of the tomorrow's groups, and then we'll wrap this up. Sure. Just very quickly, tomorrow we have our head of industrial policy for the Department of Defense. They will be here first thing in the morning, Jen Santos, and she will be participating in the uh, kicking off our investor panel, which, as you know, this is a critical part of our strategy, being able to partner with those investors that are out there. And then for the afternoon, we have one of our lead innovators in DOD, Jay Dreyer, who's the director of the Strategic Capabilities Office, along with the Pick a Doctor, uh, just an immense amount of brain power that is available, talking through a variety of very critical things like digital engineering. Uh, we have a discussion on ITAR, making sure that companies have the ability to continue to export and have access to global market. Uh, we have other discussions that'll be going then, what does it take to be a pilot of these types of vehicles in the future? If you're going to be an orb pilot, you are going to definitely want to hear the closing discussion that we have on simplified vehicle operations by Carl Dieter. And then on Friday is discussed 
hopefully get to come back and see Ben Marcus and the fantastic air map team along with over 60 other presenters in these virtual booths. You get to wander around for a couple of hours before and a couple of hours after our regularly scheduled programming to actually see and have some one-on-one -on -one discussions. Uh, they're able to pass files and pass electric business cards and all kinds of fascinating things, uh, all while socially distanced. So you'll want to see that. And then we've got our community awareness, our workforce development discussion that happened this Friday morning. And then finally, the grand finale with our chief of staff of the United States Air Force, General Goldfein, participating in the discussions at the end of the day, along with special guests, again, members of Congress that will be here ready to help launch and this unveiling of this new aircraft that you get to see. So thanks for everyone's participation today. Really looking forward to these last two days. Please don't hesitate to provide feedback on how we can continue to make this a better experience and get closer to uh, this future of flying orbs today. Brandon, hand it back over to you. And the closing thought is we did indeed set a new world record for the number of breakouts. Uh, it was a little rough for some of you, but that's in the spirit of innovation that Dr. Roper inspired us to do on Monday morning. So thanks again for joining us. Look forward to tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Eastern on the website agilityprime.com or the AFWorks YouTube link. We'll be providing all the details all day long. Thanks so much. Have a great night. Four computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions.